This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. State budget problems have brought conservatives and liberals together on one big issue, prison reform. Hello, I'm Lloyd Patterson. This is CTC Connecting the Community. State Senator Greg Evers recently spoke out on the need for change in Florida's expensive penal system. Look, when you've got a $4 billion hole to fill, you look under every rock. And I don't think that we're, we're not going to turn prisoners loose that's going to jeopardize anyone's safety. But we may look at alternatives uh, to incarceration, uh, such as monitoring, uh, such as even going to, uh, uh, you know, some drug rehab in lieu of incarceration. If a person, you give them drug rehab, costs you $16 a day. If you incarcerate them, it costs you 42 here are the facts. Florida spends $2.4 billion a year to house just over 100,000 inmates in 150 facilities. Many inmates get released only to be sent back to prison within a few years, the recidivism rate it's called. Governor Scott says his reforms could save taxpayers $1 billion a year, though not all right away. One idea, transfer several thousand inmates to privately run prisons. There are other ideas being kicked around, including increased use of treatment and diversion programs, as Senator Evers mentioned. Well, our guests have some ideas of their own. Kim Skavasky is a private in private practice in Pensacola after years first as a prosecutor and then almost 20 years as circuit judge for this district. Susan Watson is director of the area office of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Connie Bookman heads Pathways for Change, a program she founded six years ago as a treatment alternative to prison for inmates with drug and or alcohol problems. And Dr. Richard Huff is instructor with the UWF Criminal Justice Studies Department and has some three decades in the field. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for making time to appear on this program. It's an interesting time in Florida history, isn't it, when you have uh, conservatives and liberals have said all along, of course, that something needs to be done about the prison system, but now conservatives are seeing it differently. Kim Skavasky, are you surprised? No, I'm not surprised at all because there's a need to, to save money. We're in a terrible budget uh, condition right now, and so it's not unusual that they're looking for any way to do this, but it's, it's, it makes sense beyond saving money. Unfortunately, that $2.4 billion that you mentioned, only 1% of that uh, goes to substance abuse treatment and vocational educational training within the prison system. And that has to, I mean, if there's gonna, going to be a process of cutting the budget, then cutting that 1%, I see further trouble because most of the people that go to prison get out and are back in the community. And if you haven't done something for them within the prison system, and regretfully, of course, our penal code is based on a system of punishment, not rehabilitation. Uh, that may swing back to uh, looking at these alternative programs as a means to, uh, to protect society as well as save money. Rehab sounds better th when people see how much it costs to keep a person in, in behind bars for a year. Connie Bookman, what, what was your reaction when you heard about this talk about prison reform in Florida? I'm grateful. I don't care why they choose to talk about reform. I'm just grateful. I mean, since my work in 2004, hearing the stories, these inmates will not change without some cognitive behavioral uh, treatment. So they've got to think differently. When they start smoking pot with their mom and dad at nine years old, uh, and they continue and will teach their children that. Somebody's got to intervene. Okay. Susan Watson, I imagine that you are just jumping for joy <laughs> over this. Absolutely. And I think that we incarcerate far too many people. Um, in the state of Florida, it's one out of 85 adults is in prison. 
in the United States is one out of a hundred adults. We really need to take a look at um, our sentencing. Why are we incarcerating people that are doing, uh, that have crimes that are nonviolent and are, really are not a threat to society? So I'd like to take a look at that, and I am all for treatment. Dr. Huff, your opinion on the governor's uh, plan to save money on prisons? Uh, the governor's plan is wrong-headed in a number of ways uh, in terms of having the, the, the understanding of some of the issues other than the dollars. Uh, the reform, very much welcomed. I think if everybody can come to the table and come up with some great ways to do the reform, certainly alternatives to incarceration, which are, uh, they've been out there for a long time. We're long since past where you just hold people until you punish them. Uh, and like Judge Gavaski, you have all of the many intermediate sanctions that can be used along the way to, to really target what the offender needs. Uh, as commented on, you, you have certainly an extremely high rate of incarceration in the U.S., but we've done a great job using probation. We've done a great job uh, entering into some programs, but, but again, we've not gone nearly far enough in this state with spending the money necessary to give treatment to those to, to help them once they reintegrate back into the community. Okay, an impression I have, and tell me if I'm wrong on this impression, but in Florida, as in, as in most states, I, it seems to me that it's rather hard to get thrown into prison. You don't usually see people put in behind bars for their first offense. It's usually several things have happened. They've committed a bunch of crimes, and the judge has finally thrown, said, you've had enough second chances, you're going to jail. Is that, is that fair or not fair? Well, it depends on what the first offense is. If you know, right out of the box you commit a murder, you're going to prison. If it's a series of drug offenses, typically it does take a while before your points add up to the point where the, the court's going to incarcerate you. And, and in terms of drug-related offenses, that's an area where I think many people agree that there needs to be a concentration on alternatives. But even a burglary, and I say even, that's a serious crime, but a burglary of an of a occupied dwelling, for example, is going to dictate, in most instances, a, a prison term. So it depends on the offense. But, uh, you know, going back to what Susan brought up and Rick as well, in terms of the, the high percentage of individuals that, uh, of the population that go into the prison system, it's even higher if you consider the African-American community because 50 percent of the inmates, or almost 50 percent of the inmates within the prison system are African-American. And that's very disproportionate to their, their, their numbers within our population as a whole. So uh, poverty has a lot of right. uh, to do with, with the people that go into the prison system. Uh, and that may sound very liberal, and I'll own up to it. But, the, you know, that's a concern that uh, really troubles me because when the financial condition within the state turns sour, the first that are going to suffer are those who are already suffering as a result of their, their poverty. Dr. Huff? Uh, Twenty years ago, I built the first juvenile boot camp in the state of Florida, and uh, we started with a group of young men who were uh, we had about 27 of them in the, in the first grouping, and it was very elite. To get into the group, you, you had to have a minimum of 20 prior felonies, but we had the entire state to choose from. This was the first time ever, but again, overwhelmingly coming from poverty situation. Uh, we dealt heavily with educational programs, behavioral modification programs, reality therapy. Uh, almost got in a fight with a producer from ABC who just wanted to show pictures of doing push-ups and running and drill instructors yelling at them when we were so proud of our literacy lab, our aftercare program, because the reality is if you, you take this young person who's had this questionable you know, upbringing, lifestyle, connections, deal with them for a while, build them up, give them tools, and then throw them back right into the location, as we all know, where they came from without that follow-up care and support, then perhaps much of the money we spend is going to end up being wasted. So ab absolutely, there's, there's so many other issues other than, gee, it seems cheaper to do this rather than that. We have to look so much more broadly than that. Susan Watson? I just think we have to take a look at not incarcerating people in the first place. When we have people that commit crimes that are offenses that are nonviolent, victimless, we really need to take a look at uh, not incarcerating them, 
using some other means for their rehabilitation. Um, the Blackwater Prison in Santa Rosa County, we spent $131 million to build a 2,000 bed facility. You know, that money could be turned around and diverted into all kinds of programs to help people that are impoverished, to help people that have, you know, these nonviolent, uh, uh, you know, victimless offenses. I think that we really have to just step back, take a look at what is going on in Texas with Governor Perry and how he's diverting and not putting so many people in prison and using other means. So I just think we have to look at ways to not incarcerate our population. Well, it seems to be a pretty wide agreement that whatever it is we're doing now is not working particularly well if the recidivism rate is uh, 33 percent, and that might be on the on the low That's side. Uh, uh, and, and Judge Skovaski talked about why, because there are only one percent of the budget goes to any rehab in prison. They don't have literacy courses. They're not getting drug rehab in prison. They're just being caged. But Connie Bookman, you started Pathways for Change, which does have a very impressive record of success, but you don't just pluck anybody out of the court system and put them in there. They, you, you, you have a certain criteria. They have to be interested in changing their lives, don't they? They do have to volunteer, uh, and they are nonviolent offenders. I'm all for locking up the real bad guys. Um, the 5 percent that will not return uh, probably need to be in prison. That's why we need our prisons. But the ones that need to learn a new way of living, I mean, they were raised with um, an acceptance level that you would be shocked. Uh, and I encourage anybody that wants to judge our prisoners um, in our Scambia County Jail to join us. We're starting a program for women at Central Booking and Detention. We just started last month. We're starting a program at Morris Court, mentoring and tutoring. So before you make a judgment about these bad people that need to be locked up, come join us and, and learn about the issues that they can't read and that it's okay to bring drugs into the house. And yeah, on and it, on. It's true what my uh, observation experience has been as we look at the, the county jail system, the people in there, if you talk to them, they've had fantastically terrible home lives that are unbelievable that you know, it's amazing that they're doing probably as well as they are well, with, when you hear their stories. In 2004, I went to Dennis Williams and said, you know, we are teaching these wonderful classes to women, uh, but we're doing more harm than good. We're teaching them about domestic violence and how to set boundaries, and we're throwing them right back, as Dr. Huff said. So I said, what are you going to do about it? And I wasn't really sure. Uh, learned about therapeutic communities, uh, became an inmate for a week at a maximum security prison in Ohio, and learned uh, living with the women how they could think differently, how they live their life day to day. And it, that takes time. That's why Pathways for Change is 12 to 18 months of living this healthy lifestyle and people that care about them. Okay. Kim Skabaski. Well, we have examples of how it can work within the prison system, uh, and that is we have at least, I think, five faith-based character-based or character-building uh, prisons, there may be more, in which uh, there is a devotion of uh, edu education, vocational, and substance abuse treatment to those, in to those individuals. And the recidivism rate for those, uh, I can't give you the accurate statistics, but I'm, they're impressive compared to the, the numbers in the regular prison system. Plus, there are these facilities that are known as transitional facilities where uh, they prepare the individual who's about to be released, I think they send them there after they've got about, when they've got 18 months left in their right. sentence, right. and they uh, prepare them for getting work and, and getting, getting reintegrated uh, into the community. And that can be done on a more wholesale basis. There's just not enough facilities. I think there's a waiting list for like 10,000 inmates wanting to get into the faith-based uh, facilities, and uh, there's a reason for that, because they, they want help, they want treatment, they want to prepare themselves to, to, to live in the community without reoffending. What's the uh, average Florida prison inmate learning while he's in prison? How to commit more crime, uh, generally speaking, and uh, how to continue to manipulate and how to, you know, kind of work their way through the system. And again, not those skills when they go back. The programs 
have been developed. They've been developed nationally, locally, regionally, you know, internationally. There's, there's a lot of programs out there. It's a matter of recognizing that you have to spend a certain amount of money. And of course, you know, penny wise, pound foolish, if we spent the appropriate amount of money, it would in, in almost every instance be far, far less than the cost of imprisonment. There's always argument about what does it cost to keep an inmate one year in a jail or a prison. The argument over what's included in that price aside, we know that prevention type measures, building the person, et cetera, is, is far less expensive. From drug treatment to psychological counseling to literacy, 75% of jail and prison inmates do not have a high school diploma or a GED. That, that's an unbelievably huge you know, kind of a number. Uh, and when you could target things at the family. We don't like to think in these complex terms. We listen to someone running for a two-year term of office or a four-year term of office saying, I'll solve this in my term of office. That's never been realistic. Uh, it would be refreshing to have people listen to this type of conversation we're having today and recognize these are, these are complex matters. It takes a little time. Okay, so if Governor Scott calls you on the telephone and says, give me some ideas, uh, how can I save... Uh, uh, a few hundred million dollars in what we're spending now in our state prison system. Uh, Kim Skavasky, what would you tell him? Well, and I'll ask, I want to ask everybody. I'm afraid I have to say you have to spend more money uh, to get the right results. So if it's just a matter of, uh, of saving some money, then you can start, you know, cutting the sentences down and letting people out on the street. That's not a wise thing to do from a public safety aspect. So I, I don't know that I could tell him how to save money. I, I could tell him how to spend money more wisely. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, when I was on the bench, I think you may be aware that I served as a drug court judge for 11 years. And that was an alternative program, which uh, was very rewarding for me because a lot of people that came into the program, but for the existence of that program, would have been facing uh, a prison sentence. And it was very successful, it is very successful, it continues uh, to thrive right now. But um, I agree with Susan that we, we incarcerate too many people. I, I'm not a proponent of putting anyone in prison for uh, drug use at all. There has to be a, a way to deal with these people in our society beyond incarceration. Uh, that just has not worked. Uh, it's it's. Are you calling for legalization of, of drugs? I don't want to go down that path too far, but is that well, what you're one saying? Well, one of the good things about being a retired judge is I can say what I <laughs> want to say now. I, yeah, I, say, actually I, say what you think. I, some things I, I, I had to be a little more circumspect about, but I think the drug war has failed, and I, I do believe in some um, theories of decriminalization, if not legalization. I just think that if you really want to put fear in the hearts of the drug cartels and the people that make a lot of money off off drugs uh, is to talk about and really, re really talk about decriminalization and, and uh, some form of legalization where even the state steps in and takes over. So, um, yeah, I think that has to be on the table because I don't think the drug court, uh, drug uh, war has worked. At least, I don't think it's struck uh, fear in the hearts of the of the cartels down in Mexico. Mexico certainly isn't any safer. And that, uh, but, the, but the legalization question as a whole, uh, we'll do that. Hot another, political another potato that but, uh, you're not going to find a politician, <laughs> and I'm not one, and I'm not ever going to run for office again. So I can say it's a political hot potato that people, politicians won't want to hold on to. My question is, how can you save the state a lot of money, $2.4 billion spent now on a housing 100,000 people in our prisons? Connie Bookman, how would you tell the governor we can save a lot of money by doing this. Well, I can talk about Pathways for Change. We're 82% success. Uh, we have 49 graduates. Uh, we have a budget uh, for five full-time employees of under $300,000 a year to run our program. And it is a beautiful operation because we use passionate, master's level uh, psychology and social work and criminal justice interns that spend a year with us to up to three years. So we teach them the curriculum. They then in turn teach our men and our women uh, in our communities. That saves a lot of money. That's one way. Okay. Susan Watson, you, you're telling the governor what? I tell him to, to take a look at the mandatory minimums. I tell him to legalize drugs. I would tell him to use alternative programs ra rather than putting people in prison. Okay. Dr. Huff? Uh, have to agree that the, the idea of the war on drugs, it's an unfortunate analogy uh, because that's a political, you know, 
term that, that uh, we think, well, if it's a war on something, we have to win it, when that's a war on the American public. That's a war on fellow citizens. So it's, a, it's always been a very unfortunate one. That said, absolutely lost it because there's supply reduction, demand reduction. We've shown that supply reduction can only be uh, so effective. Demand reduction is important. So Governor Scott, first thing to do, convert so many of these you know, kinds of work with the legislature to convert a lot of the drug kinds of sentencing and the true nonviolent. Now, of course, you know, we talk about first-time offenders in law enforcement. We generally look at that as first-time caught. It's uh, not too often that your first-time offender truly is just offended for the first time. Uh, recidivism nationally is actually about two-thirds, about 66 percent of all people who go to prison who are felons uh, go back into the prison system. That's profoundly upsetting to the public. They don't want to see that. Uh, that you can't, with our you know hopes for uh, kinder, gentler sentencing and uh, some of the programs that unfortunately get referred to as hug a thug, that uh, those aren't always going to be the things that work. What we do know is if we do treat their addictions, if we do treat the lifestyle, if we help them build a skill set, work on literacy, have that aftercare, that's going to save a lot of money. Private prisons, the governor needs to read those studies. Private prisons do not do a better job. In fact, they do usually worse. They're uh, run on a shoestring. They hire people who aren't qualified to be hired into the public systems. And they cherry pick inmates, taking the nonviolent property offenders, leaving to the state the intractable, you know, violent, more chronic types of offenders. So targeted programs, a shift away from mandatory sentencing for drug users, not for drug dealers. You've all said things that are going to completely disqualify you from ever running for office. I, I hope you realize this. That's what but we're all going for. What we have seen, what we have seen in the last uh, five, ten years is a reduction in crime. We're living in a safer society and some say that's because we put so many bad guys in prison who are not now out there committing crime. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough for the guys in prison, but uh, it's safer for the people on the outside. Agree? No. Not agree. The majority of people that are in prison are not in prison for violent crimes. The majority of people in prison ha are in prison for uh, victimless crimes and nonviolent crimes. The, that's the truth. And somebody, you know, you said we all have said things that will keep us from running for office. Somebody's got to stand up and say the truth. And we need to take a look at this and be smart about how we use our taxpayer dollars. We're spending tons of money in cars, keeping people in cages rather than treating their addictions. But some of these people should be in, in cages, shouldn't they? And I, if, they're, if they're in there, they're not out there robbing your house. They're everybody, you of course, people that are committing violent crimes, people that are committing heinous crimes should be, and, and that make us unsafe, of course they should be incarcerated. I'm not saying that. I'm saying let's be smart about who we put in jail and who we don't. You know, let's be smart and use alternative things that are cheaper and more effective than keeping people in cages at a cost of $20,000 a year. Kim Skabaski. I don't necessarily agree with Susan that uh, the majority are in there for victimless crimes. I think that there's a large number that are in there for nonviolent crimes, uh, but, you know, grand theft is going to have a victim. Uh, so uh, going to the question of whether or not the reduction in crime as a result of the number of prisons that we have and the number of people we have in our prison system, uh, I think that there's an argument against that as well. Uh, and, and we're going to see, I think, with the, the economic downturn and the, the increased levels of poverty, particularly, well, it will have, been, will have impoverished uh, state uh, employees if, uh, if Governor Scott has his way. Uh, yeah, boy, you're dancing around <laughs> the political issues. That's not part of the discussion here. Uh -huh. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I, I, I see you're, you're saying that the prisons are not necessarily protecting us from from crime. Well, not when uh, most of the people that are going going into prison are going to be getting out of prison. Um, and if you just wear, you can't warehouse them forever. Um, so, as Rick said, what are they learning in there for the most part? Uh, how to victimize? Um, so. It's, it's That's not what we want them to learn, no. Dr. When you, when you see that, as I said, the recidivism rate being at least two-thirds in most cases, uh, deterrence isn't the thing that necessarily works because the deterrence 
isn't consistent enough, it isn't certain enough. If you were told as a kid, well, your father gets home, you're really going to get it, and nine times out of ten, dad was too tired when he got there to do anything, there was no deterrent message there. All you learned was how to work that system at home. This is very much the same. Violent crime has been on a decline for about 23 years now, but that is not connected to arresting more people. We've, we've been arresting more people, you know, rate-wise uh, every year. Uh, the reductions are tied certainly more to issues of economy, issues to impoverishment, and the fact that, you know, uh, home life isn't model, though there's an argument that it's never really been model, but there are programs that we could do to, you know, help people more. Uh, I, I think even chronic uh, nonviolent offenders have a place in the jail and the prison system if they've proven that they're part of that percentage that accounts for huge amounts of the crime. All the figures and the numbers and you put the dollar signs that your insurance company can give you show that chronic offenders cost us less when they're in prison rather than they're out. Now, with that said, that's a small percentage. If we could get better at identifying those offenders and targeting them while shifting dollars and resources to help the governor help our budget, we can save that money. We can help do the right thing and it'll serve the politicians as well by allowing them to drop some budget. I can't believe it. We're, we're down to our, our last couple of minutes here and I've so many things I wanted to ask you about that I, that I didn't get around to, but it does seem from what you say that there's a lot we, that we understand about uh, prison and not sending, uh, putting, keeping people out of prison that we just don't implement uh, because of the pressure for long prison terms for the lack of space for rehabilitation? Is that, is that fair to say, Connie Bookman? I think what's fair to say is if we can educate them and give them a vocation, teach them something that they can do that will bring an income so that they can have a home, they can pay off their restitution, then we're on to something. Kim Skabaski. Well, Florida has developed a culture of, of imprisonment and, and, and punishment and uh, we're recognized as one of the toughest states in the union as far as that goes. Now, the pendulum seems to be swinging a little bit because of financial woes, but there's still a heavy prison industry in the state. And, you know, th they build prisons with projections from years ago, so there's still prisons that are on, on, on paper or the, uh, right. the ground has begun to be turned for that. And, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay. unfortunately. I, I, I'm sorry, but we are right down to the wire. Kim Skabaski, thank you very much. A private practice now, former judge. Connie Bookman, Pathways for Change. Congratulations on all your good work. Susan Watson, appreciate you being here from the ACLU. Dr. Huff from UWF, uh, great having you. Thank we you. should have an hour or two. There are so many more things we need to cover. That's all we're going to do right now. I'm Lloyd Patterson for WSRE. Thank you for watching. Good day. <laughs>